of Science in Israel, and uh, the topic of his uh, uh, the, the title of his talk is uh, "Imaging the Electronic Quantum Wigner Crystal in One Dimension." And uh, Professor Ilani, the talk is uh, thirty minutes. Uh, I will remind you when the time is up. Yeah. So now, uh, yeah, welcome. Yeah, and please get started. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yang. And I first want to thank Hong Kong and uh, Eugene for uh, putting together this uh, wonderful conference. I think it's very timely now. And uh, they invited me to talk about uh, imaging of uh, Wigner crystal, which we did in one dimension. So I'll talk about that and I'll uh, remind, uh, say a bit about other things that we've done recently. Uh, so our approach uh, for the Wigner crystal problem was that uh, we actually want to see it. We want uh, to, to see how it ordered in real space. And uh, basically what I want to show you is that uh, Wigner crystal are fragile phase, uh, very fragile. And to see it, we really needed to develop a new kind of scanning probe that can detect single electron without being too invasive. And that's uh, the subject of this talk. So uh, the previous uh, G basically in Mansur already gave um, ex an explanation on when a Wigner crystal is stable. I just want to add one more uh, comment, which is that if you go back to Wigner's original paper, you read it, you see that Wigner made a big deal out of the idea of having flavor for the electron. Let's say spin, or it can be valley. And the reason for that is that if electrons have only one flavor, they know how to avoid each other just by Pauli exclusion. So the state with one flavor is not very different if it's a crystal or not. Whereas if they have two flavors, electrons from spin down do not know how to avoid electrons from spin up. And the solution for that is actually the crystal ground state when these electrons are staying at different location and become completely non correlated correlated in different ways. Good. So, so um, you heard a bit about the history. There, uh, uh, the, there is a history of very heroic experiments, in uh, both in electrons on helium and in semiconductor, mostly two-dimensional system, trying to look for these states. But as you heard, these are very, very challenging experiments. And in fact, there are, if I'm trying to put it in very simple terms, there are two main reasons uh, why it's so hard to be a Wigner crystal. The first one is that it's hard to create. Uh, we heard before that if you want to get a Wigner crystal with Coulomb interaction, you need to go to the dilute limit. And this means that if you have a small amount of impurities, uh, the electrons would stick to the disorder and would not interact with themselves. So the crystal would be destroyed. So that's the first problem. The second problem is how do you see a crystal? Um, you can measure it with macroscopic probe, but if you really want to see and see it directly, you want to use some sort of free space probe. And here comes the problem that the imaging tools that we have in condensed matter system now uh, are just too invasive for um, detecting this fragile state. So for example, uh, an STMT brought very close to a crystal like this would just move the electrons that is move along instead of imaging them. So if you want to solve this problem, you need um, two things. You need to have an extremely clean material system and a non-invasive imaging tool. And that's what we realized that we can solve using a new generation of carbon nanotube devices that we developed. So um, a technology that we developed few years back was a technology that allow us, allowed us to nano-assemble nanotubes on top of ele electrical circuit of very high complexity and do it in a way that would not damage the electronic properties uh -huh. of them. Um, and this is our basis for a clean system where we are going to see the crystal. But this is also the basis for our detector because if we take this uh, chip and flip it over, and we have nanotube at the edge of this chip, this uh, nanotube becomes a very sensitive electrostatic detector. So at low temperature, at the center of this device, we get a quantum dot. 
And if we measure the transport through this quantum dot, it's a single electron transport obeying Coulomb blockade physics, which means that the current through the nanotube is an extremely sensitive function of the potential induced on it with a periodicity of one electron. So this means that if we can measure the current here reasonably on a place where the slope is relatively high, it, uh, we can measure potential very, very sensitively, much better than the potential of a single electron. In fact, with this technique, we can measure up about uh, 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus uh, six electron charge per square root hertz, which means that it's a very sensitive technique to look on individual electrons roaming around in 2D. Now, what's nice is that these electrons uh, not ha don't have to be close to you uh, or in tunneling contact to you, like in STM, they can as, might as well be buried because what we are doing is we are detecting the electric field that emanates from them. So they can be buried beneath a layer of, let's say, a, a HBM. So I'm going to talk about one dimensions, but before jumping to that, let me just give you a quick, uh, a quick summary of things that you can do with such a detector, or we did like in the last couple of years. So the first thing that you can do is you can image flowing electrons. Essentially what I mean is to do the scanning version of what all, you all know as transport experiment. So if you think of a transport experiment, let's say in graphene, you, you make a device that looks like this, a whole bar, you run current, and you measure voltages on given probes. So for example, you can measure long longitudinal voltage. If you have magnetic field, you can measure whole voltage. You all know it's very great and very helpful technique, but it also has problems. The first problem is that you measure these voltages only at very discrete points. Second is that it happens only in the perimeter of the device. You don't know what's happening in the bulk of the device. And the last problem is that if you are looking on very fragile flows, the presence of these probes are going to influence the flow that you are looking at. So what we decided is that maybe we want to get rid of these probes altogether and use our scanning nanotube single electron transistor to image the potential that is produced by a flowing current. So basically scan it while we flow current, see what's the potential that these electrons generate, and learn from that how the, their longitudinal and, uh, whole uh, resistance are made. So uh, a typical experiment at small magnetic field would look like that. And if we increase magnetic field, it would become this and that. So you can really see by eye here the whole angle that you see in transport. So this is a very nice tool. We can look on many, many different uh, mesoscopic, ballistic, electrons, optics problem. And in fact, we are doing the, uh, a lot of these kinds of experiments now looking on quantum resistances, negative non-local resistances, magnetic focusing, all this we can see in real space and get images of. So that's one thing, looking on voltage drops. But in fact, the fact that you can look on whole voltages means that you can also look on or image current density with this technique. Because whole voltage drop is roughly speaking related to the local current density in your 2D system. So let me just give you one example. If you take oh. the simple graphene channel and look on the whole voltage drop here, the whole field, oh, no. which is close to the current density. Someone is not muted. And then if you look at low temperatures, uh, you see that it's very, very flat. And this is exactly what you expect from ballistic electrons that propagate through this channel. But if you heat up, you heat up the device uh, and heating up opens phase space for electrons to interact with each other, you don't get a solid phase, but you do get something that looks like this, a parabolic profile. And the parabolic profile is actually the signature of a liquid phase. This is the Poissy flow of water in a pipe. So this is seeing directly electrons behaving hydrodynamically. So these are measurements of out of equilibrium transport-like properties, but we can measure equilibrium thermodynamic properties. And we've been doing it uh, recently in collaboration with a group of Pablo Ferrero Herrero on magic angle graphene. 
let me just mention two quantities that can be measured and uh, say interesting things about the physics. The first one is the electronic compressibility. And what uh, we see when we measure the electronic compressibility, when we image it on devices like this, is that very close to the magic angle, there is a very dramatic phenomena in which compressibility undergoes sharp asymmetric transitions uh, between highly compressible and low compressible, high compressible and low compressible. And this physics describes in big terms, breaking of flavor symmetry. And this breaking of flavor symmetry happens at rather large temperature, much larger than the other correlated states in the system. So in a sense, what we're seeing is what sets the stage for all the other superconducting and correlated insulator in the system. So this is compressibility, but another less common uh, dynamic quantity that we can measure is electronic entropy. And this is a very recent experiment where we saw that magic angle graphene in some places behave like uh, helium-3 and has the exotic Pomeranchuk transition. So near a feeling of one electron in the Moiré lattice of magic angle graphene, we see a transition uh, similar to helium-3 going from liquid to a solid phase upon raising temperature, we see that electrons in magic angle graphene go uh, from something that looks like from a Fermi liquid to a phase where all the mo or a lot of moments are free, just like in the solid helium-3. Uh, uh, and we see this by um, monitoring the phase boundary of this phenomena, but also by measuring directly the entropy of this phase. And we see that when we measure the entropy of this phase, that there is a large component, about one degree of freedom that is completely free for these electrons. So uh, in solids, uh, it's very natural to understand why spins are completely uh, disconnected from each other. So you would expect it, for example, in an electronic system in a Wigner crystal or a MOT insulator. The surprising thing that we don't understand about the discovery yet is that this free moment phase is actually metallic and has good compressibility. So it's not clear what kind of phase could generate this that is not insulated. So uh, now let me go from 2 to 1D. And uh, we, we want to look on a Wigner crystal and uh, nanotube is, is a good place to look. I told you that already that by assembling them very cleanly on device, we can get devices that have practically negligible disorder along the nanotube. The devices can be complex enough, for example, here with all these gates, and these gates allow us to confine and play with the electrons the way we want and do different kind of experiment on a crystal like that. And the last thing is that in this geometry, the interaction between electrons is the strongest you can imagine in any condensed matter system because the electrons are effectively suspended in vacuum. Okay, no dielectric scaring. All the gates are far away. All right, so let's say we have here a correlated state that looks like a crystal. How would we see? If we want to see it with a scan probe, uh, for example, STM or AFM, it means that we need to bring the uh, scan probe close enough such that we can resolve the individual electron. So it has to be closer than the distance between two electrons. But you can see that there is a problem here because if we do that, we will destroy the physics that forms the crystal, which is the interaction between the electrons that would be screened by this probe. Okay, uh, so that's one problem of any macroscopic probe. And the second is that any microscopic probe always come with work function and many, many added electrons that are not under control. So if you were, you were to scan a probe like this across a system of few interacting electrons, what you will do is that you will kick around, the, uh, kick aside the electrons and basically would not image their undisturbed state. So, so how can we, how can we do it? How can we image the state of electrons without perturbation? So we need a detector that it's small enough such that it doesn't screen interaction. 
and it carries very little charge such that it doesn't influence this energy. Okay, and the solution, as I told you before, is to use nanotubes also as the detector. And you can see that a nanotube is a small one dimensional object and you can imagine that field lines going between two electrons in your, uh, in your other system would not, most of them would not go through this nanotube. So nan this nanotube would not affect screening. And the advantage of having very, very clean nanotubes is that you can make sure that in this other probe nanotube, you have the minimal amount of charge that is needed for probing such that you do not disturb the state that you are looking at. So how do we do it practically? Um, we built a custom-made uh, scanning probe microscope working with uh, electron temperature of 50 millikelvin. And this microscope can take two ultra clean nanotube chips like this and bring them close to each other such that one nanotube is perpendicular to the other. So the first nanotube here, the green nanotube is going to be our system. That's where we are going to do the physics. And the other one is going to be the probe. And the probing method would be slightly different than the one that I described. It's not going to be a scanning single electron transistor. It's going to be even simpler. It's going to be a scanning charge. Uh, and the idea is that we use the top nanotube as a host for the minimal number of charges that we can do, which would be one electron. We are going to smear the charge of this electron as a long sausage such that the other electrons are going to see only a fraction of this charge. And then we are going to scan it across these electrons. And from the interactions between these two subsystems, we will be able to deduce what is the many body density of the system down below. So let me explain this principle slightly in more detail. So, so imagine that this is the system nanotube where we are going to form these multi-electron states and look at. So what we're doing is we're using the gates, we're creating two barriers, we're confining here the U electrons, which we can add one by one to this uh, potential web. So let's start with the simplest case to understand the, the probing method. So let's start with one electron and imagine that this is its wave function. Now, if I come with a probe, this probe adds tiny local perturbation. Uh, and this perturbation is going to shift the energy of the state. How much is this shift going to be? You know that to the lowest order, it's just um, what you need to do is to bracket the potential between the wave function. But since this is a local perturbation, it means that the shift is proportional to the psi square, the local density at this place. And this is something which is uh, very intuitive to understand because if you put your perturbation in a place where we have a lot of charge, this would create a lot of energy shift. If you put it in a place where there is no charge, it's not going to do anything, okay? So this tells you something very powerful. It tells you that if we can measure the energy shift of the state as function of the position of our perturbation, we can in fact image its density in space and it doesn't matter if it's many body density. This that's works the same way and density of a many body state. So how, how are we going to measure the energy of the state? So we're going to reference it to Fermi energy in the lead. So we start with the state in resonance with the lead. And then when we move our probe, uh, our probe, yes, uh, the energy shifts. And what we do then is we shift our, poten our potential with gate voltage such that the state is again in resonance with the Fermi energy. And the shift is directly proportional to the energy shift. So this means that if we can follow the gate voltage uh, that uh, is needed to stay in resonance as function of the probe position, we can image the density of these states. So let me start with the simplest experiment uh, of just one electron. So we are, we are putting here a box uh, with one electron confined and we want to image its wave function. So we are going to be around the resonance of this single electron and the way to detect it is not by running transport through this electron. We don't want to disturb it in any manner. We, and the way we do it is by adding another quantum dot here on the side and using this, the small coupling, electrostatic coupling between this dot and 
this electron um, to tell uh, whether it's re in resonance or not. So, so basically we are going to measure the current through this dot and detect the transition of this electron. So this is uh, how it looks. So as a function of the gate voltage on the blue gates here, you see that at some point we have a spike if you want in the compressibility of the system. And this spike marks the transition between having zero electrons in this well and one electron. And so now we see the first electron that goes into the box. And now we want to image it in real space. And as I told you, what we need to do is just bring in the, our scanning perturbation and see how the position of this uh, resonance changes in gate voltage. So let's do that. So let's scan. So when, as we scan it, you see that the position moves, then it moves all the way in the center, it's here, and then it's going down. So what you see here, this shape is the shape of the uh, uh, density of a single electron confined in a potential well, of course, convoluted with uh, the, the, the size of our detector. Good. So it's just simple perturbation theory. Now, uh, if it's perturbation theory, let's do the first uh, simple test, which is um, to check what happens if we put more and more chargers on our probe. And you see that indeed the, the sh energy shift increases, uh, um, but the shape remains. Uh, you can see that already if we put three electrons on the probe, the shape start changing, become more sharp. And this shows you that th having even three electrons is already too much. You start moving around the electrons. So you really want to focus on the lowest number of electrons. So I showed you the imaging of one electron. And now we want to go to the interesting part, which is many electrons in a box. So, so it's very similar. Uh, the only difference is that now we are going to look on the nth transition of this state. And this, the, the condition for the end transition is that the state with n electrons is degenerate with the state of n minus one electrons. Which means that if we, I, I repeat the same argument that I gave before, uh, um, what we will do with our scanning probe, we will either shift the energy of the n electron state or the n minus one electron state. So what we will image is the density of n electrons minus the density of n minus one electrons, which I'm going to call the differential density. And this is a quantity that is easier to understand if the electrons do not interact. This is just the density that we add that the last electrons that comes into the system adds. And it turns out that um, this differential density uh, is going to be very, very different for non-interacting electrons and a Wigner crystal if the electrons have flavor. So uh, let's see that. So for non-interacting electrons, you know how electrons feel uh, a potential well. These are just the particle in a box state the, the, with the one peak, two peak, three peaks, and so on. But in nanotubes, you know that we have four flavors for the electrons, two for spin and two for valley. So how would the, if we image the electrons as we put them one by one into this well, how would they look if uh, there is no interaction? So the first electron would look like that. The second electron would look exactly the same, but with opposite spin. The third electron, fourth electron would look also the same. Only the fifth electron would have two lobes and then six, seven, eight. Now, it's going to be completely different if there is interactions because ele interacting electrons want to avoid each other and they repel each other no matter what their flavor is. So, so if we put one electron in an interacting system, it would look the same because it doesn't have anything to interact with. But once we, once we reach two electrons, they would already start avoiding each other and three electrons like this and so on and so forth. So you see that if there is a flavor, it's very easy to distinguish between two, these two cases. In the case of strong interaction, you will get a peak with every additional electron that you add into the system. So this is something that now we can try to have a look. So we're going to repeat the same experiment, but now with multiple electrons in the probe, in the, in the system. So this is the picture that I showed you for one electron, one electron. This is two electrons, three, four, five, six. And you can see that uh, the picture is very simply consistent with what you expect from a lattice. With every additional electrons that we put, they put in the system, we get one additional peak. 
So these are real direct pictures of a Wigner crystal along this one dimensional line. But so far, um, this can might as well be classical crystal of electrons. So the question that we want to ask now is, how can we tell if it's a classical crystal or a quantum crystal? So we want to do a simple experiment that would show the quantum nature of this object. So which experiment we can do to test for quantumness? One simple experiment is tunneling experiment. So the question we are going to ask is how do quantum, uh, how does the quantum crystal tunnel through a barrier? And this is an interesting question, was asked theoretically many, many times in the past, and we'll be able to do the simplest version uh, of this question experimentally. So you know that if electrons don't have interactions and we force them to tunnel through a barrier, then the tunneling of an electron would be independent of all the other electrons that are below the Fermi energy. They just so, don't care about it. Professor Ilani, sorry to interrupt. Five uh, more minutes. Yeah. Sure. Um, so these are non-interacting electrons, but in the interacting picture, we know that uh, it should be completely different. So if electrons want to hop to the other side, it has to push the coordinates of all the other electrons, what we often call orthogonality catastrophe. And this means that this tunneling has to be a medium body tunneling and it has to be a quantum dense. Many coordinates have to change together, okay? So until now, I showed you experiment within a simple quantum well, okay? But in fact, we can do this tunneling experiment we have, uh, because we have all these gates. We can change, shape the shape of the potential here and make it such that we have a barrier in the center. And what we are going to ask is whether tunneling of an electron across here is going to be a single particle tunneling or it's going to be a collective dense of this object. And we want to see pictures of that, okay? In the simplest case, that is not trivial, okay? So let's start though with the trivial case as a calibration experiment. So the trivial case is one electron. You also, this problem, this is a double well problem. It means that the electrons can be on the left, it can be on the right. The relevant parameters for these problems are the common gate voltage, which changes the energy of the two wells together and the detuning that changes the relative energy with respect to each other. And if we put one electrons, one electron in this double well and measure uh, the phase diagram as function of these two parameters, we, we get this well-known double dot phase diagram that I guess you all saw one time or another. So here the numbers in the brackets tell you how many electrons there are in the first well or in the second well. And the lines are transitions. So there are two types of transitions here. There are charging transition. For example, here across this, we add electron to the left dot. Across this, we add electron to the right dot. But there is another line here in the center, which is not a charging transition. The charge in the system remains the same, but what happens here is that electron tunnels from the left to the right. Now you can see, if you have good eye, you can see that this line here is wider than the lines here around. The reason for that is that the lines around, the charging lines are limited by our very, very low temperature. Whereas this line is wide because it's limited by the quantum tunneling from one side to the other. So we really want to look at this line and, and see uh, how the, the many body density of tunneling looks like. So we are going to do similar experiment to, to before. What, the condition that determines this line is that the energies of these two states before and after tunneling are equated. And if we are going to follow how this line moves with our scanning perturbation, we are actually going to look on an equation like this. And as what I explained to you before, it's going to give you the density, the, the difference between two densities. But now it's the difference between the density, the many body density bef before the tunneling state and after the tunneling state. Okay, the difference between these two many body densities. So for one electron, it's going to be simple. If an electron was here before and here after, if we do the difference, we will get something that looks like a dipole. And this is the experiment. Here you see the experiment. We follow this line, we see very beautiful dipole, and you can clearly resolve that the electron tunnels from this point to that point. Okay, but I remind you, 
what is the question that we are trying to answer now in the last slide or two of my talk, which is whether the tunneling is a single particle tunneling or a many body collective quantum tunnel. Okay, and this differential density, in fact, is a very good quantity to uh, tell that. Because if only one electron moves and we do the difference, then these uh, uh, inert electrons disappear and we see only this electron that moves. So we get one dipole, just like in the single particle case. But if all three electrons move in a quantum coherent manner and we look on the difference, it would look like this. It would have three dipoles, one large one in the center for the electrons that jumps across the barriers, but two other ones to the two electrons that move together with it. So here is the experiment. We do the same experiment, but now for three electrons. You see here a wide tunneling line as compared to the narrow charging lines. And when we image this transition, we clearly see this pattern. And this pattern exactly tells us that this tunneling is a many body tunneling. In fact, we can easily reproduce it with a DMRG calculation that shows how is the wave function before and after, how much each of the electrons is. So with this, I want to summarize and acknowledge uh, the people who did the work. So in Weizmann, uh, the experiment was done by Asaf Hamo, Ilani Shapir, and Sharon Pecker. The theory was done in Budapest by Pascu, Orsch, and uh, Gergely. I just want to uh, advertise a small thing that uh, Asaf uh, uh, has moved into the group of Amir Yacobi and he is now doing a different kind of scanning experiment, scanning experiment with NV diamonds. Uh, and he has a beautiful experiment about seeing hydrodynamics not due to electron electron interaction in tungsten ditellurite. Asaf is finishing his postdoc, so you should keep an eye for him. Uh, so with this, I want to summarize. I showed you that with nanotube as a scanning probe, we can do a lot of cool things. I showed you that we can get to the limit where we probe with one electron or maybe even the fraction of an electron. I showed you pictures of Wigner crystal and I showed you that this object is quantum as it many body tunnels through a barrier. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. So we have uh, time for, I guess, one or two questions, yeah. Uh, is it possible to ask a question? Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, okay. In the work, you didn't really talk a lot about uh, this nature paper where you saw the compressibility mm -hmm. change sign. How do you interpret that? Uh, in the magic angle, yes. Yeah, how do you interpret that? So um, our interpretation that uh, what is happening is that uh, whenever you reach an integer filling factor, the system, the, there is a very large Fermi surface reconstruction. And basically what happens, let's say, as you start from neutrality point, uh, all flavors are symmetrically being charged. And the density of state is low. So there is no tendency to stoner instability. But the density of state increases, increases, and increases as you go to the top of the bed. At some point, there is some feeling that there is, you, you pass the criterion for stoner instability, and then something dramatic happens that one flavor take all the carriers and reset all the others back to the neutrality point. So we call it Dirac revival because these four, uh, three other carriers have to go back to the Dirac point and refill again. And that's what happens again and again and again they start feeling the, the, so this band become full inert. And then the other three start filling up again and again and again until they reach an instability. One takes all the air, pushes these two back. And then they need to recharge and so on. So, so um, this simple model with the simplest Dirac, Dirac band structure, no, not putting the complicated structure, band structure of uh, magic angle, give you the essential feature of what we're seeing. Of course, there could be other things, electrostatic contribution, heart rate contribution, a lot of interesting questions. It's like this is the essence of what's going on. So if you have other questions, please raise hand. 
we have probably time for one more. But your your answer is, I mean, your resolution oh. is not okay. inherent to strong correlations. Again, which resolution and what experiments well, are this we sort doing? of Dirac, uh, you know, this sort of jumping of the flavor is not really an inherent strongly correlated picture. Whereas negative compressibility typically is a sign that the correlations are very large. Okay, so you see, A, you see strong negative compressibility. Do you see where I'm pointing with the arrow? Right. So you see how much it goes beyond the dashed line. So there is right. strong negative compressibility. Right. There is strong, you know, th these are stoner line instabilities, which are definitely the sign of strong interaction. Yeah, but your explanation didn't invoke anything like that. No, no, of course. We do heart refoc that include exchange, and you get stoner like a mean field. In the mean field, you get stoner like instabilities. Of, of course, it includes interaction, strong interaction. In fact, you don't, if the interactions are very strong, it becomes boring again. You need uh, U over W of, this, of the order of one. That's what we find to, to see this kind of thing. So, we find that the magic angle graphene is in fact in this interesting intermediate region where interaction is not too strong and not too weak, exactly over W equal one. Okay, uh, so uh, let's thank Professor uh, Ilani again. Yeah, so thank you for the wonderful question. talk. So young, there's another. Yes. Oh, I had a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's another question from Professor yeah, Dashama. Yeah, a comment, uh, comment on what uh, Philip was commenting on the talk, Shell's talk. Uh, Hartree Falk actually does a very good job of, for compressibility. Hartree Falk is a many body theory as far as compressibility goes, because it's basically chemical potential. Hartree Falk gives effective mass very poorly, but for compressibility, is a many body theory. And that was basically the answer. I just wanted to resolve the discrepancy. You know, uh, people normally do not think of Hartree Fock as a many body theory, but it's well known for compressibility, it captures more than 95% of the physics. So, so it's, everything is okay. <laughs> Thank you. Although so, we still see more interesting stuff as I showed on the right hand of the screen. So, this, this, this is still open question. So maybe can I just jump in since I'm a co-host, I cannot raise my hand, but I still have a question. <laughs> so, uh, yes, please. Well, actually, uh, I'm curious about spatial resolution of your probe, especially in the 2D. Uh, because clearly, right, you are sort of trying to reconstruct a two-dimensional distribution of charges, right? And but using a conductance. Uh, so somehow you integrate some distribution of the density. Mm -hmm. So is like so this, how... These, yeah, these experiments were not done at high resolution. In principle, our technique now can reach a resolution of the order of 100 nanometers or so, but we did not push it even there. Uh, like this experiment was done by averaging on regions of let's say half a micron. And in fact, um, we see that there are domains that um, in this experiment, we see domains that are bigger than that with well-defined angles. So if you look on a big sample, you will see that the twist angle changes from place to place. You will see a map of different domains, each one of them with different twist angle. And what's nice is that you can go with the probe and get statistics of how the physics changes with angle. Now, you're right that we cannot look with this probe on the individual Morai scheme. It's not, it's not suitable, but in a sense, it's good because we want kind of the more thermodynamic physics, right? We, we are not interested in here in the individual electrons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's thank you, uh, Professor Ilani. So uh, our uh, next uh, 